Well, I sure appreciate y'all being here, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to Buster for, for asking me to be here. Um, I've got a very strong belief in, in our profession and a very strong belief in what we do. So, so it's really an honor and a pleasure for me to be here and to have the opportunity to share with you some things that I think can be extremely important to our profession and to our athletes. I believe we're in one of the greatest professions in the world because of the fact that coaches can be some of the most influential people in our entire society. You think about it. We've been given the unique opportunity to work closely with hundreds of young people on almost a daily basis at a very teachable time in their lives with the opportunity to develop not only knowledge and physical skills, but worthy values and attitudes and character traits. What a great purpose. And what a great opportunity our profession carries with it. What a great opportunity you have as a coach. You know, I read an article a few years back written by Sam Rotigliano in the American Football Magazine. Uh, and some of the stats that was in that article really jumped out at me. I wanted to share those with you. It said that there are approximately 140,000 junior high, high school, and college coaches in America today. And in a lifetime, each of us have the opportunity, if we stay in coaching for our full career, to impact over 20,000 young people. And you think about that. The potential, influential power of the coaching profession, I believe, is unmatched. We have a great opportunity and I believe a responsibility to have a positive impact on our schools, on our community, and collectively on our society. I really believe that our young people today, more than any other time in our history, are desperate and begging for love and for discipline and for direction. And what we as coaches are doing with the hearts and the minds and the souls of those young people is a whole lot more important than any facts and figures that we can give them or, or any skills that we can teach them. You see, I believe a coach has two tasks. One major, one minor. The major task is in the attitudes and character traits that we have an opportunity to teach like no other place in education. And our minor task is in teaching the skills and techniques of the game. And all too often we get those two mixed up. I believe that football and all interscholastic sports are a very important part of the educational process, as I'm sure all of you do. I believe that we are in danger of losing our educational-based athletic programs as we know them today. And the only way for us to counter the negative scrutiny which athletics receives is by talking about the many good things that are and the good qualities that our programs have to offer. Every opportunity we have, we need to make it a, a point to take a few minutes to stand up for our programs. We need to sell our programs, and we need to point out to the people in our communities that our most important job is not in the skills that we teach, but it's in the intangibles that we have an opportunity to teach like no other place in education, not another course out there can teach that. Intangibles like developing self-confidence or teaching the value of hard work or developing habits of dedication and sacrifice or teaching leadership skills or the development of strong character traits or teaching self-discipline or teaching the importance of a proper mental attitude, which I believe encompasses all those things. I think sometimes as coaches, especially as younger coaches as we come into the profession, we pass over these intangibles 
as being corny, but they're not. They're the most important things that our athletic programs have to offer the educational process. And it's extremely important that our coaching community understands that, that what we have to offer the educational process, the development of character and the development of attitudes and those things, is more important than anything else that we can do, and it's more important than anything else that those kids can get in the educational process. They're not going to get that in a history class. They're not going to get that in a math class. But boy, do we have an opportunity to teach that in athletics. Attitude to me is the key to success. It is therefore most important to our overall programs that we find ways to teach and stress the importance of a strong, of strong character traits and a positive attitude. You know, the most important thing, I believe the most important thing that I can do as a coach for my players or that teachers can do for their students or that parents can do for their children is to teach them the importance of a proper mental attitude. Let me share some things with you that I've heard about attitude over the years. I've heard it said that in America today, there are over 50,000 different types of schools that would teach us how to do anything and everything from how to trim toenails and fingernails to how to operate heavy machinery to how to become a doctor or how to become a lawyer. But there's not a single school in existence today that will teach us how to be any better than mediocre unless we've got the proper mental attitude. I've also heard it said that our attitude as we undertake a project is the most dominant factor in the success of that project. In short, our attitude is really more important than our aptitude. Several years ago, there was a study by Harvard University that revealed the fact that 85% of the reasons for success, accomplishment, and promotions out in the business world are because of our attitudes and less than 15% because of our technical expertise. This is what uh, Chuck Swindoll, Dr. Swindoll, wrote about attitude, and I think he hit the nail on the head, and probably a lot of y'all have already heard that, but just like anything that that comes across strong, it's worth repeating and worth rereading, and I want to share it with you this morning. This is what Dr. Swindoll said about attitude. He said, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance or giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home, a team. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing that we can do is to play on the one string that we have, and that is our attitude. And I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our own attitudes. Now, if attitude is, is that important, then what? Exactly is it? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, if it's really that important, what exactly is it? I used to take our players into the classroom, and we'd spend a week in the classroom talking about different things that we felt like was important to them. I think it was the most important week that we ever spent in our program. And we, when we went in the classroom, one of the first things that we talked about was the importance of of a proper mental attitude. And I shared those things that I just shared with you to our kids. And I asked them that same question. If attitude is that important, what exactly is it? If you look it up in the Webster's Dictionary, it says your attitude 
is your attitude is, is the most dominant factor in the success of any project. But that's, here's, here's how attitude works. Let's see. If you look it up in the Webster's Dictionary, this is what it said. I'm sorry, I got off track here. Attitude is the habits of the mind which one displays. That's what the Webster's Dictionary says it is. Abit, attitude is the habits of the mind which one displays. However, my most favorite definitions come from my players. One of my players said, Coach, I believe your attitude is the choices that you make. I think, I think he's pretty close to right. I believe your attitude is the choices that you make. Another one said, Coach, I believe that your attitude is how you think. And I think he's right, too. I think your attitude is how you think. Here's how I believe your attitude works. How you think, the things that you allow to go into your mind, how you think, determines the choices that you will make. And the choices that you will make determines the habits that you develop. And the habits that you develop determines the person that you become. Because when you choose a habit, you also choose the end result of that habit. Your attitude is those little yeses and nos that we choose each and every day. And we're making those choices a mile a minute. You think it's important for your kids to understand that? I think it's a critically important for them to understand that. Those choices determine who we are and what we become and who we're going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. Examples of attitude that we're choosing each and every day. When, we, when that old alarm clock goes up, off and we get up and get out of bed, we're making choices a mile a minute. And some of those examples are we can make a choice to be enthusiastic about the, the day or we can choose to have a sour disposition. It's our choice. We can make a choice to be a hard worker or we can make a choice to be lazy. We can make a choice to be committed or we can make a choice to just go along with the crowd. We can make a choice to be persistent in our efforts or we can make a choice to just quit when it gets a little bit tough. We can make a choice to be disciplined or we can make a choice to just take the easy way out. We can make a choice to love, or we can make a choice to hate. You see, all of those are attitudes. All of those are determining who we are and what we're going to be down the road. We're making those choices for ourselves. We're responsible for things for ourselves. And I think that's really important for our young people to understand. They've got the ability to make that choice. But it's important that we as a coach put that on the table, that we help them understand that, that we help them realize that they're going to be good and they're going to be strong if they're making the right choice. If they're, one of those is a positive attitude, one of them is a negative attitude. The positive attitudes lead me towards my goals and my success in life, and the negative attitudes keep me from getting there. And they're the ones that's making the choice. And we've got to help them understand that. The difference between accomplishment and failure is having the right mental attitude. Making the right thought. Taking, thinking the right thoughts. Making the right choices. And developing the right habits. That's why it's so important to help those kids understand that what they allow to go in their mind is shaping who they're going to be. And they've got to guard their minds. They've got to guard what they allow to go into their minds. Nobody else in education has got the platform to do that more than high school coaches. I really believe that. I believe high school coaches are the most influential people in our nation. And if, we, if you think about it, if we all came together and, and tried to make those things happen, boy, the influence that we could have on our society 
would be unbelievable. And I really believe that. You know, the remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding what we allow in our minds. Those things control our thoughts and our choices, the person we are and the person we're becoming. Sometimes those choices are easy choices. But many times those choices are tough choices, and not everyone's willing to make the tough choice or answer the tough calls when they come along. Making tough choices takes, committed, dedica- takes a committed and dedicated person. I'd like to share with you a story about tough choices and about discipline that I used to share with our, our players every year. Every year we'd go in the classroom and every year we would talk about these things. And the story that I shared with our players, I was, I'm not sure whether it was told that it is, but it's, it's a great story. And set out to develop the finest strand of horses in all the world. And to do that, Mohammed brought in the very best 50 men that he had. And he sent those 50 men out on a mission. And they were to to go out and search the world for the very best 100 horses that they could find. Sure enough, those men went out and they searched the land and brought back to this man named Mohammed, brought back to him the very finest 100 horses that could be found in all the land. And Mohammed took them, in, took them and trained them himself. And he trained those horses in only one discipline. And that one discipline was this, that Mohammed had a silver trumpet. And every time he would blow that silver trumpet, he trained those horses to come directly to him. No matter where he was, no matter where they were, when he blew that silver trumpet, baby, they came right to his feet. Well, it took Mohammed about six more months to train them in just that one discipline. But when he trained them and he felt like that they were, they were trained as much as he could train them, then Mohammed and his men took those horses out into the Arabian desert, and they corralled those horses up on a bluff that overlooked an oasis of bubbling cool water that was about 100 yards away. And they didn't give the horses anything to eat, and they didn't give them anything to drink. And at the end of three days, boy, those horses were frantic. They were at each other's throats. There was no more that they could be contained within that corral. And then came the test. Mohammed lifted that silver trumpet, and he blew it one more time. And lo and behold, one horse yielded, reluctantly, but obediently. And that one horse turned, and he answered his master's call. And from that one horse, they raised the Arabian strand of horses, the finest strand of horses known to mankind today. Now, the message is this, that one out of a hundred answers the really tough calls that come along in life. That one out of a hundred are truly committed individuals. To be our best, we've got to be willing to answer those tough calls and to make those tough choices. We've got to be willing to hold on to those things that we know to be right and to refuse those things that we know to be wrong. Even when it seems like the rest of the world is saying yes. You know, as coaches, you and I, we teach by example. And I think it's important for us to be what we expect our kids to be. Sometimes answering the tough calls means not following the majority. Some of the toughest calls our young people have to answer are overcoming peer pressure. I believe that being a strong example for our children helps them to be strong. As leaders of young people, we've got to realize that sometimes what we do speaks so loud they can't hear what we say. 
Leaders are leaders because of what they do, not what they say they're going to do. You know, despite the overwhelming evidence which supports the importance of a proper mental attitude, our entire educational system virtually ignores or is unaware of that vital factor. And this is where athletics becomes a very important part This is what General Douglas MacArthur said. He said, the game has become the symbol of our country's best qualities. And many believe in these days of doubt and indecision that through this sport, we can best keep alive the spirit of reality and enterprise which has made us great. Upon the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that upon other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory. Archibald McLeish, a Pulitzer Prize winner, said this. He said, I think I learned more on the two Yale football teams I played on than I have before or since about certain very fundamental and important matters. Without more attention to the things of the mind and spirit, there can be no human understanding. And without such understanding, the technological information which man has gathered is meaningless. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale said this. He said, Jesus always followed what most interested people. He talked about the lessons found in everyday life. You can be sure he would find many lessons in American sports. He taught all of the qualities that make for good sports. Discipline, courage, selflessness, compassion, dedication, personal excellence, and the rest. And President John F. Kennedy said this. He said, I sometimes wonder whether those of us who love football and appreciate its great lessons, that dedication, discipline, and teamwork are necessary to success. We take it for granted that the players will spare no sacrifice in becoming alert, strong, and skilled that they will give their best on the field. This is as it should be, and, it must never, and, and we must never expect less. And I am extremely anxious that its implication not be lost. Now, athletics has always been at the forefront of social change. Playing sports has helped our country break down barriers of segregation and racism. It has brought the world together in times of war and, and has provided inspiration and optimism when the public needed it most. It is my belief 
that there is no activity in our schools today that has any more carryover value for adult life than competitive education-based athletic programs. Athletics are the last stronghold of discipline that we have left on our campuses today. And the leadership of our coaches has never been more important. Every coach is in a position that allows them to directly influence the attitudes and character traits of their athletes. Whether it is a, in team meetings or before and after practice or simply casual conversation, coaches have more opportunities to positively influence our players. And it doesn't matter what sport you coach. Your players look to you for leadership, guidance, and instruction. Coaches through sports have a strong platform for delivering a message and positively impacting our, student, our students, our schools, and our community. Sound athletic programs can provide valuable lessons for practical situations. The daily influential power of a positive coach can be life-changing. Student athletes experience daily victories, discovering within themselves the ability to overcome adversity, to develop leadership skills, to develop winning attitudes and character traits, to be hard workers, and to be a part of a team which requires sacrifice and service to others. These things are the direct result of quality coaching and the value of coaching kids on a daily basis. And we, and the value of coaching kids on a daily basis and our immeasurable qualities and helping them make strong choices and to develop strong habits. Over the years, the state of our society has significantly changed. And children are flooding into our educational system, laden with social issues that could hinder and negate their chances for success. Coaches and teachers are forced to deal with these social issues and these problems in our society continue to increase. Our young people are in need of strong role models more today than any other time in our history. In the area of moral values, it's no secret the American family has changed. Many parents are divorced. There's an absence of a strong father figure in many homes. In our juvenile courts, 80% of the court dockets are filled with youngsters who come from divided homes. And on top of that, we have the most powerful methods of media communication in the history of mankind. And it's barraging us every day with powerful negative messages regarding violence and drugs and alcohol and pornography and terrorism and world holocaust and anything else that might sell newspapers or a little bit of airtime. One of the most important things we want to address through our association and our Coaches Education Foundation is our vision to create social change by identifying an epidemic that is quickly becoming a major threat to America's society. That epidemic is a lack of fathers and positive role models in the lives of American youth. Wayne Horn, <clears throat> a former director of the National Fatherhood Initiative said this. He said, this is a national crisis. In fact, I believe it's not just one of many national crises, but it is the national crisis. Because father absence drives almost every other social problem that we experience. In 1950, 6% of American children lived in fatherless homes. Today, over 35% of our youth live in homes without a father. America currently 
has the highest percentage of fatherless homes of any country in the world. Statistics gathered by the U.S. Census Bureau clearly backed up the belief that the fatherless home is a national crisis. This is what that census said. I want to share it with you. 65% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homes and runaway youth are from fatherless homes. 85% of children who exhibit behavioral disorders are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent parents in substance abuse centers are from fatherless homes. 70% of the youth in state institutions are from fatherless homes. 85% of rapists motivated by displaced anger are from fatherless homes. So how do we fight this epidemic? While nothing can replace a dad and getting fathers back into homes is something that we need to pray fervently for. There's something that we can do about increasing the number of positive role models who are out there. If a coach will use the platform that sports provides to teach not only the sport but life skills and principles such as commitment and service leadership and respect and responsibility and teamwork, then we could start to change the downward slide of our country. This movement can come through a coaching profession that is united in its purpose. We believe that through coaches, through a coaches leadership summit, which we put on in Texas annually, we can start and grow that movement. There's a quote by Edmund Burke which says, All that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is for enough good men to do nothing. One of the most important steps in the the development of a vision or a goal is to realize that we can't afford to stay where we are. We can't keep going down that same road and get to where we want to be. We've got to find ways to teach character development in our schools. Almost every social issue that we are dealing with today can be traced back to the demise of a positive role model in the lives of our our young people. I can't think of a profession that has the ability to stand in the gap and address this epidemic more than the coaching profession. As coaches, we have an opportunity to be a big part of the solution, depending on what we teach and expect and demand through our programs. You know, I've probably you have too. I've, I've sat in teachers' lounges and coaches' offices, and I've heard teachers and Coaches say, hey, do we have to do it all? Can't we just do what we are trained to do, teach the such essential elements of our subjects? Do we have to teach them and raise them too? Well, you know what? The school and the family are about all our kids have. And if some families are unable to respond, then who else is going to do it? You see, I believe that American kids are just too precious for us to ignore the realities of our time and to just abandon them to fate. Yes, I guess we've got to do it all if that's what it takes. You know, and coaches coaches see this and understand this more than anybody else in our society. I really believe that. We see it every day, and we understand it. In the course of a lifetime, almost everyone is positively affected by someone in a life-changing way. 
You know, I came across paths with such a person 48 years ago. It's a long time ago when I was in college. His love and enthusiasm and commitment to living life to its fullest have walked with me all my days since to influence and encourage me even today. His name was Jim Wacker. He was a great football coach, but more importantly, he was a great man whose beliefs and teachings and wisdom go far beyond sports. His philosophies help you to bring out the very best in yourselves and in others in all areas of life. And what I learned from him had much more to do with living life than playing football. Those of us who had the opportunity to, to play for him and coach with him have been blessed beyond measure. The skills that he taught us on the field, like discipline and dedication and teamwork and personal excellence and focus and organization and leadership, those are the same tools that, that we use in the real world. He wasn't just teaching us about football. He was teaching us about life. Coach Wacker gained respect with a very simple method by how he lived his life. He showed us how to be a good father and a good husband. He had a genuine care and concern for others. He always found the good in every person and in every situation. He worked harder longer and smarter he was by far the most enthusiastic and influential person i have ever worked with he led by being himself you saw how true he was to doing things right coach wacker was more interested in the process than the result this was very important to him he really wanted things done correctly and it started with the way he did things. You wanted to follow him and his example because he stood for what was right. Coach Wacker helped me to realize that as coaches, we teach and lead by example. And it's important for us to be what we expect our players to be. You know, I'd be willing to bet that every one of you have had or will have as strong of an impact on, a, on one of your athletes as Coach Wacker had on me. In closing, I'd like to share with you a poem that when I was coaching, I used to share with my coaches each year. I think it's a great message for coaches, and uh, as I said earlier, it's one you've probably heard before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, and this is how it goes. It's entitled, I'd rather watch a winner than hear one any day. And this is how it reads. I'd rather watch a winner than hear one any day. I'd rather have one walk with me than merely show the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the coaches are the ones who live their creeds. For to see the good in action is what everybody needs. And the lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give. But there's no misunderstanding in how you act and how you live. I'd rather watch a winner than hear one any day. You know, before I close, I want to put a plug in for my son wrote a book on the classroom. He played for me at Judson. He was, he was a quarterback for me in 92 and 93. And we were fortunate enough to win back-to-back -back state championships that year. Uh, when he was quarterback, it's probably the, the best years of my life. Um, but he's, he's, uh, 
He's 42 years old now, and he's got his own family. And he wrote a, a book called The Classroom. And it's about, it's, it's about what we did in the classroom uh, at Converse Judson. Talks about a lot of the things that, that I talked about here. But his name's Clint Rutledge. And the title of the book is The Classroom. And he al also has a study guide that goes along with that, that uh, if you're interested in doing some of those things in the classroom, um, that, that is also available. But I just wanted to put that in there. Hey, you've been a great audience. Uh, thanks for being here, and, and thanks for your kind attention. Uh, I wish you best of luck and to every one of you and what you do. And I appreciate, boy, I, there's nobody that appreciates coaches more than I do. And I sure appreciate all that y'all do. God bless.